This series began talking about lineages that started out billions of years ago in the last episode concerned clades that emerged only a hundred million years ago. This episode has us entering into the Upper Cretaceous, the most popular part of the most popular period of all of paleohistory. This was the height of the age of the dinosaurs, when there were herds of ceratopsians and flocks of feathered manoraptors, giant duck-billed dinosaurs, and of course, terrifying tyrannosaurids. But it's not all about the dinosaurs. At this time, there's a couple interesting things going on with lizards, too. For example, this 92 million year old fossil is Dallasaurus, which means Dallas lizard, because it was discovered here in Dallas, Texas, where I live. A lot of paleobeasties have the word saurus in their name that aren't lizards at all. For example, Tyrannosaurus rex means tyrant lizard king, but it wasn't a lizard. It's from a line of dinosaurs that were warm-blooded with four-chambered hearts, hollow bones, and often feathers, not like lizards at all. But the pioneers of paleontology didn't know that yet. And this fossil, discovered in 1834, was given the name Basilosaurus, but it turned out to be a whale, which isn't even a reptile. Dallasaurus, however, is an actual lizard. Its closest living relatives are monitor lizards, like the Komodo dragon from the family Varanidae. Varanids and iguanids, along with skinks and geckos, are among the oldest lizard families that are still around. Now, how do we know that these fingers were webbed? And two things imply this. One is that the broadly flattened rudder-like tail is highly adapted for swimming, and the other is that the skull of this lizard exactly matches that of a lineage of later lizards that have all turned their hands into flippers like those of whales or ichthyosaurs. And this type of skull matches the very first fossil that was ever identified as an extinct species. Ironically, when the first Mosasaurus was discovered in 1764, it was thought to be the skull of a whale because it was so big. Actually, they called it a breathing fish, because back then people thought that whales were fish. And nearly 60 years later, someone with a better understanding of anatomy and zoology realized that this was actually a lizard, but the size of a whale. Having proof that lizards could ever get as big as whales is the reason why, when they later discovered fragments of the first known dinosaur skeleton, they named it after an iguana, and they named the whole clade of them dinosaur, meaning terrible or fearfully great lizards. Only later did they find out that dinosaurs were more like birds than lizards. And this humble little lizard appears to be the crown of mosasaurs, which soon became massive sea monsters, filling the niche that was left vacant when the ichthyosaurs mysteriously went extinct shortly before the mosasaurs appeared. And from this guy on, for 26 million years until the end of the Cretaceous, mosasaurs were the apex predators of the Mesozoic Oceans, in which there was stiff competition to be the biggest, baddest, and most horrible denizens of the deep. The Mesozoic was an era when every medieval sailor's worst nightmares were real. The Mosasaurs looked a lot like the giant monitor lizards alive today, who also have forked tongues like snakes. The Mosasaurs have a few features that seem intermediate between monitor lizards and serpents that have them classified along with serpents in a clade called Pythonomorpha. And the first Mosasaurs appear in the fossil record shortly after the first snakes. And there are a number of modern lizards that have greatly diminished legs, so small they can barely walk on them. And some lizards lose their legs altogether, looking superficially like snakes. But they're not snakes. Just because a lizard doesn't have legs doesn't make it a snake. Although snakes are lizards too, they're a subset of lizards, and they used to have legs. For example, Pachyrhychus problematicus and Eupodophus descuensi are a pair of fossil snakes from the Upper Cretaceous period, roughly 95 million years ago. And they both had pathetically puny little legs. Just the back legs. They didn't have any front legs at all. Yet even when they still have legs, they're still obviously snakes. Because snakes have some pretty distinct modifications that make them unique among all other reptiles. In fact, there's another older snake from 27 million years earlier that still had all four legs, albeit tiny and useless. But there's debate that it might not be a snake. Not because it still has legs, but because it doesn't have, or doesn't yet have, some of those uniquely serpentine traits. Modern snakes don't have any legs at all anymore. And the only one that has any vestige of those hind legs are male boa constrictors, who have a, just a couple of claws left, which they use in mating. All the other snakes lost every remnant of their legs altogether. So once upon a time, long time ago, snakes had four tiny legs, just like most skinks still have today. But those legs were useless because the snake had grown a bunch of extra vertebrae and figured out how to take their increased length and wrap their bodies around and literally squeeze the life out of their prey. 
These earliest snakes hadn't specialized beyond that, though, so they weren't huge or heavily built constrictors like pythons, nor did they have specialized fangs like vipers. The earliest snakes would have been more like harmless garter snakes or gopher snakes, snakes that are so primitive they don't even have those little sensory pits in their face. And somehow, even without their own uniquely adapted specialized senses or great size or paralyzing venom, Having no arms or legs turned out to be a huge advantage for the snake because there are thousands of species now making snakes the most successful of all reptile groups in the modern day. Having snakes around may have had an impact on our ancestors because at this time they were still small scurrying mammals looking rather a lot like this tree shrew. And the best way to get away from snakes and everything else that came after us back then was to go up into the trees. And there were some important changes going on in the trees too. One of them being that some of these trees were getting really big. This is when we see the appearance of metasequoias. And the only sequoias we have left today are in isolated regions of China or California, but there were once vast forests of giant redwoods from coast to coast all over the Northern Hemisphere. Another more important change is that this is when we see the appearance of nuts and berries, when trees began to bear fruit. And trees either protected their seeds inside of hard shells or within sheaths of juicy material that would help them germinate when they fell. Initially, the strategy was that if this juicy substance was poisonous, that would keep the mammals from eating them, but they kept doing it anyway. And through natural variation, some berries were less toxic than others, and some were even tasty and nutritious, and this caused the strategy to change, becoming a symbiotic relationship. Trees with poisonous berries didn't do nearly as well as those trees whose fruit was good to eat, because the animals would eat the fruit and be satisfied with that. They wouldn't eat the seeds but they would leave them scattered over a wider distance than they could have fallen otherwise. Thus, the animals helped the trees to spread their seed. So their, our ancestors became arboreal and developed a diet of nuts and berries and other such things. Estimates based on the molecular clock, averaging significant mutation rates for different lineages, say that by this time, Eurochontogliars like us had already diverged from Laurasiatherians. A few million years later, by at least 88 to 70 million years ago, Eurochontogliars divided too, when rodents and lagomorphs became their own thing. And Eurochontogliars without the gliars are just Eurochonta. And the prefix EU, U, just means true. So we can reduce that down even further to Archonta, meaning ancestors. Eurochonta means true ancestors. And that lineage bears a number of adaptations to living in the trees and eating their fruit. One is that if you're in the canopy of a forest of giant sequoias, you can't just set your food down because nuts and berries are round and will roll down the grooves and off the branch. So you have to hold on to your food while keeping yourself on the branch too. So, you know, there's some skill involved. If you accidentally drop something, you can't just reach down and get it. <laughs> Not when it fell several meters down and there's dinosaurs and snakes and all kinds of scary things down there, including weasel-like triconodonts and massive meat-eating metatherians to contend with. And that's if you could even find whatever it was that you dropped, so it's not worth the risk. You'd better hang on to your stuff because you'll only drop it once and it's gone. And that means that their hands had to be dexterous, better able to manipulate things than any animal on the ground ever had to. And the ever-changing maze of contours in the trees demands some skill in keeping yourself from falling out of there. And lightweight animals tend to flit about pretty quickly. And this means improved motor skills, not just in the hands, but in the arms, legs, everything. Here's a scholarly list of synapomorphies shared by all archontans. These could all be simplified as increased dexterity in the limbs, particularly the elbow, shoulder, wrist, hips, and ankle. There also needs to be a bit more brain. Not just for the enhanced motor skills, but also because arboreal animals very often have to leap from branch to branch or even from tree to tree. So they have to be able to estimate distances and decide whether that limb will hold them or what will happen if they miss. And that leads to the most diagnostic feature of Archonta. To explain, rodents and rabbits down on the ground need to worry about everything down there that could jump out at them at any moment from any direction. So their eyes are positioned on the side of their head for the widest possible range of vision. They're even able to see behind them. Up in the trees, you don't have to worry so much about what's on the left or right, but you'd better be able to make sure you can complete that leap to the next branch. In order to gauge distance, you need depth perception. And that requires binocular vision. So both eyes should face forward to overlap their view and produce the broadest possible three-dimensional image. In every episode, we talk about the diagnostic features of a new clade and then ask the question of whether you meet the criteria to belong. In this case, 
That question is, do you have the hand-eye coordination, the balance, the skill, dexterity, ability to judge distance, eyes forward? If so, then you are a true Archonta, and they were your true ancestors.